Hi there. <laughs> Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of all of the people that are involved in this ministry, we want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are blessed that you can join us today for this time in God's Word. And we're returning to continuing on in our study of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians. And we are now in chapter 4, and we're going to start uh, in verse 15. Is that what I said? Yes, that's what I said. 4.15. So we'll do that right after this first. Father, I just praise you and thank you, Lord God, that we can gather in your word, your word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. And Lord, that during this time, your son Jesus Christ would be glorified, that we would grow in him, be more like him by the working of your word in our lives. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you've made that promise, that that is a grand promise, that we will be conformed into the image of your son, those who you have predestined. And that's our desire, to be more like your son, Jesus. All right, as I said, well, we're going to pick up, we're going to start in Ephesians 4.15. But I, I need to make note of the fact that as we left last week in verse, in the prior verse in 14, uh, where it says we're no longer to be children. And I, I mentioned, because we we're supposed to mature, to grow up. And Paul wrote, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. And I, I took note of the fact, and I pray that you took note of the fact, that there, when Paul was talking about being childish, he spoke before he thought. He said he spoke, then I think, you know, part of being mature is don't, don't think, don't talk before you think, right? We're not to be childish, but mature, so we need to grow up. And in Ephesians 4 to 15, it says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Now, there's a thing that I've called for years, righteous rudeness. <laughs> now, and that may sound, it may sound silly, it may sound offensive, whatever it may sound, but rudeness is defined as having a startling abruptness or a display of disrespect by not complying with the social norms of, or etiquette of a group or culture. Jesus Christ was not constrained by the social norms or etiquette of the people around him because that will keep you from speaking the truth. You'll adjust the truth to make people happy, all right? Think about Nicodemus, when Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, a Pharisee, a prominent Pharisee, came to Jesus in the dark of night, and he wanted to talk to him. He wanted to talk about, you know, are you, are you, the, are you the Messiah? And Jesus looked at him and said, you must be born again. Whoa, wait a minute. That's like, you think that caught Nicodemus off guard? I bet that it did. But that's the truth. You have to be born again. You have to be born of your Father in heaven. You know, it, it says... That in the Pentateuch it says that, that the sins of the father are passed on to the children, generation to generation. And that goes on and on and on and on. So you were born into this world with a stain of Adam's sin on your, on your spirit, on your soul, right? There's no way that you can heal that. There's no way that you can fix that. The only way that you can get rid of that curse, and I, I hear people in, in Christianity talking about breaking the generational curses, there's only one way to break that generational curse, change fathers. So when you're born again, you're born of your father in heaven. And I promise you, he has no sin to pass on, only righteousness. But that's what Jesus was just very abrupt with, with Nicodemus, because he needed to be. You're not going to get into a religious debate or a political debate and, and do anything What's the, what you need to do is to speak the truth in love. That's what Paul is saying here. Think about the Pharisees. Oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, the Pharisees, well, I wanna, let me first of all mention the fact, because we talked about this before in this, during the study, about the rock of offense. Remember, it says in Isaiah 8, that talking of Jesus, 
It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Then he shall become a sanctuary both to the houses of Israel, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Or as Peter quoted, he said, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling block, a stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they, they disobey the word as they were destined to do. First Peter 2, verses 7 and 8. All right? So remember, the key to speaking the truth in love is, first of all, it must be in love. And then it has to be the truth. And that will surely offend many people, as it's easy to see in our day to day that the truth, the scriptural truth, and by the way, that's the only kind of truth there is, that the scriptural truth will offend many, many people, right? And it will offend them to such a great degree that the word of God has become come to be considered hate speech in this world today. That's a fact. You know, I, as I'm sure many of you know, I spent a lot of time in the United Kingdom and England and Wales and Scotland and all and around in Europe and, and, and preaching and teaching there. And I have started so many teachings in England by saying, I know that what I'm about to say is against the law. Because to speak out against sin in Britain is against the law. So they consider, they consider the gospel to be hate speech. How has it come to that? Little by little by little by little, by the church giving way, giving way, compromising, compromising, until we've gotten to this place. So think about the Pharisees, right? In, I'm gonna, I wanna read to you from Luke 11. I'm gonna start at verse 37. Now when he, Jesus, had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremoniously washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside you're full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees! For you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things that you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. How rude. I mean, these are the people that are so important in the society. And then, while this is going on, it says, just going beyond that, one of the lawyers, because the lawyers, and the lawyers there, they're not, the, they're, these are not ambulance chasers. These are people who were voiced, you know, trained in the law, right? They, they, they break the Mosaic law. It says, one of the lawyers said to him in reply, teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. But he said, woe to you lawyers as well. For you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some they will kill, and some they will persecute. So the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be ch charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter. You hindered those, and, and you hindered those who were coming entering. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. I'm telling you, 
when you start, start to speak the truth of God's word, speaking it in love, people will hate you, they'll attack you, they'll, because they'll be so offended. You know, Paul wrote to the church in Rome, warning against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's exactly what the God of this world, Satan, this world system is doing. He's suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. He's effectively using the world's ministry of propaganda. What's about movies, music, television, all of those things that the world loves to spread his contamination. And of course, he backs up his work with threats of reprisal for standing against him. How many people today you say there's no persecution going on in this country? I mean, people have been fired from their jobs. I just want to share this with you. you know, uh, and this is not new. I, and I'm not going to go into this in depth. But I, I, I will tell you that in, uh, I think, 1978, I had criminal charges filed against me in New York State, in the suburb of New York City, for having Bible studies in my house. People say, what? Absolutely. It was quite an adventure, I'll tell you what. God always has the victory. Um, we were threatened so much for, for doing this. I had, a, at the time, I was pastoring a church full time, but I was also the national sales manager for a communications company in New York. And I mean, it was, I, I'll tell you, it was very good job, very high position, a very well-paying position, and I reported directly to the president of the company. And I did all of the sales training for this company out of scriptures. And God was honoring that and blessing it incredibly. What happened, though, was finally one day I got called in. I did all of the sales training out of the book, basically out of the book of Proverbs, but all out of the Bible, all the sales training. Do you know that it says that all scripture is profitable, it's profitable for everything, for, for life and godliness, not just for religious stuff. So I was doing that and I got a call and I was, I had my own offices and facilities in one place about 60, 70 miles away from the uh, president's office. And I got a phone call one day and he asked if I would come over to their offices. So I, I did, obviously, I went over and I walked into a meeting where the president was there, vice president and the controller of the company were there. And they first of all started to tell me what a wonderful job I was doing, how they were blessed by what was going on in the company. And then they said, however, we don't want you talking about Jesus in the offices anymore. I said, well, that's fine. It's your, it's your business, it's your offices, you have the right to do that. I said, but I have the right to leave. So I quit. I would much rather go out and earn minimum wage and be able to talk about Jesus Christ than to stay here and earn this money and not be able to talk about him. Well, they panicked because that's not what they expected to happen. And so, well, I'm not going to worry. I did not stop talking about Jesus and I did not stop working there at that time. Satan will try to enforce his filth. And when I say uh, not all entertainment, Consider what I said, not all entertainment is evil, whether it's subtle or overt, but most is. And the mature child of God is supposed to be able to discern between good and evil. It seems to me that you can't turn on television or go to the movies without hearing and seeing filth, ungodly stuff. Remember what Paul said? He warned us against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It's like swimming in a cesspool. I was going to say, but I want to be cautious about saying this. People ask me all the time when I, you know, my involvement in politics. I said, I just simply don't swim in that cesspool. Okay. If fear of the consequences for standing boldly against the common culture can stop you from speaking the truth, how much more effective are his tactics when it comes to our unloved saved ones? The people in your life that you love, that you're close to, your family, loved ones, and they're unsaved. When you speak out about their ungodly practices or their false religious practices, 
What do you expect that they're going to do? I mean, there's only two choices. Either they're going to repent or they're going to turn on you. Okay? Now, I've experienced both of those. And their, their fear will be about they say that you don't have love, that you don't love them. Well, perhaps the question would be, how much do you love them? Because if you don't share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, you don't love them enough. You, this is a command of God that you speak the truth. You know what's the truth? The word of God is the truth. But you speak it in love. It's not an attack on them. It's bringing them that way. You know, I, I have to share this quickly. Uh, in 1977, I believe it was, uh, I was going to a seminary. I was doing graduate work in a, in a seminary. God saved me, protected me from that. And my father was living in Florida, and this, we were in uh, New York. And I used to call him every week and we'd talk. And every week I'd call him and I'd talk and I'd be sharing what was going on in my life. And I, at the time that I got saved, I owned a small advertising, full service advertising agency in New York. And we were on, uh, on track to become very, very successful. But God told me the day that I got saved, he said, you had your life, now it's mine. So I closed the advertising agency. I, I took all the clients to other agencies, and I walked away from it all. Alice and I went away to pray and study and seek God because he said, you're going to serve me. My father couldn't understand that, as you might well understand. I mean, my father was very happy to see me succeeding in business and then to hear that I was just giving it all up for something that he couldn't understand. Now, my dad at that time was a Roman Catholic, not a particularly great practicing Roman Catholic, as you know, most are not, I don't think, but he was a Roman Catholic. So he literally came up to visit and spend a week with us, not long after that. And he was there at our house, and I kept sharing the gospel with him, speaking the truth and love to him, sharing what Christ had done in my life, but more importantly, what Christ wanted to do in his life. That God the Father had sent Jesus Christ to die in my father's place so that he would spend eternity with God and eternity with me. It was that love of my father that drove me. He couldn't understand it. So anyhow, we kind of agreed to disagree. But he went back down to Florida and every week I'd call him and every week I would continue to share with him about what God was doing in our lives and doing through our lives. And, and one day or one night, I was talking to him, and all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, he said to me, Butch, he called me Butch. He said, Butch, he said, I want what you have. I want Jesus Christ. So I prayed with him on the phone that night to receive the salvation, the free gift of God through Jesus Christ. It was an incredible, incredible moment. I said to him as we were closing that phone call, I said, Dad, I love you. Now, that may sound like not a big thing, but I was a New York guy, and we were not given to saying to other men, I love you. I did. I loved him. I, lo I loved him totally, but the words were not there. And he said to me, praise the Lord. That very next night, Alice and I were at a prayer meeting, a couple hundred people there. And in the midst of the prayer meeting, I got a telephone call, or a call came in, and they called me to the phone, and it was my aunt. And she told me that my father had passed away that night, unexpectedly. It was like he got saved, and God took him. So I walked back into the room, and I, I shared with the people that my dad had just passed away, and of course there were great oohs and ahs, oh, poor. You know, and I said, stop. I said, I don't know how this, you think this works. But my father got saved and Pao Zoom, he went straight into glory. What a, what a wonderful thing. I mean, I got saved over almost 45 years ago and I'm still here knocking it out. <laughs> you know, I'm looking forward to going, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Don't be offended when somebody, don't worry about being, you know, offending somebody. Because it says in Psalm 119, verse 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. If somebody gets offended, that's their problem. It's not your problem. 
Just remember, make sure that the truth that you are speaking is given in love. Not, not argument. God has, I promise you, God has not called you to win debates. God has not called you to win arguments. God has called you to win souls. And remember this. It says in Proverbs that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. You have the power of life in your tongue. Shame on you if you don't use that power to touch other lives. It's not your responsibility how they respond to it, but it is your responsibility to share the good news. So what we're to speak is not about getting people to like us. Remember that. But to get people to love the Lord. Getting even saved, either getting them to love even more, or if they don't love at all, get them to love the Lord. But remember, it says in Ephesians 4.29, which we'll get to, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. People need that good news. People need that. And they're not going to get it from the world. The words of our mouth are also spoken to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, as it says in Philippians chapter 2. Paul wrote to his son in the faith and co-worker Timothy, and he said, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. You made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. When I first read that, I, I stopped right there and said, okay, so what's the good confession? Well, it's in the next verse. God doesn't tell you to do something without, you know, giving you the equipment to do it. So he commends Timothy for his good confession and then goes on to explain what that confession is. The next verse, he says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. What's the good confession? Well, think of what Jesus heard or said and both standing before Pontius Pilate. On that day, it says in John 19, so Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? He couldn't understand why Jesus was not trembling in fear before him. And Jesus answered to him and said, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Jesus said, my father's in control. Not Caesar back on, the, on his throne in Rome, not you sitting there in, in Jerusalem, but my father in heaven. I want you to remember at all times that your father, our father, our heavenly father is in control. He's in charge. Okay, you have to, you know, we could spend days just talking about the power of the tongue and the importance of the tongue, the things that we say. You'd be, if you ever want to do a second, as a matter of fact, if you'd like, if you write to me at office at BibleTalk.com, I would be happy to send you a little thing that I wrote a number and number of years ago, just called The Word on Words. And it's just a compilation of scripture, but it reads like a, you know, just a pamphlet, and it's all about God's Word and the power of God's Word. All right, but I just want to move on. Ephesians 4.16. From whom, we're talking about Jesus, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The proper working of each individual part causes the growth, right? Well, I'm going to say something. I look at the church and the machine is broken. It's not working properly. It's not causing the growth of the building up of the body. And that's one of the reasons is it's not concerned about it. It's concerned about building up its own little churches, not the body of Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ was trained as a carpenter. Right? So he grew up his father. This, you know, back in that society, which was not a bad thing, a father passed on his skills and, and apprenticed his sons. So Jesus 
was trained as a carpenter, working with a hammer, with wood, with nails. Hammer, nails, and wood. The very thing that Jesus was using to repair the church. Okay. If we're not fitted together properly, if you're not working and you're not working properly and I'm not working properly in the church, that's going to stifle the growth. The true, the true church will continue to grow because God causes that growth. But the simple fact of the matter is, you know, Paul wrote and said that the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. I see the word of cross as foolishness to much, much, much of the church today. Much, much, much of the church is perishing today. It's not growing. It's not a matter of how many people are in the building. It's not a matter of how pretty the songs are. It's not a matter of, it's a matter of how God is being glorified, that Jesus is being glorified in the midst, and how we are being fitted together in humility, learning to be like Jesus Christ. So it goes on and says, so this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. They become callous. You know what callous means? Calluses are hard, right? The King James says they're past feeling. They can't. They can't feel anything. If you ever have real hard calluses, you know you you don't you don't feel things with them, right? But apathetic would be the better translation, because that's basically what the Greek says. That the problem is apathy. The Greek word apathia means without feeling. Okay. Apathy is, now I'm reading from Wikipedia, apathy is a lack of feeling, emotion, interest, or concern about something. Apathy is a state of indifference or the suppression of emotions such as concern, excitement, motivation, or passion. An apathetic individual has an absence of interest in or concern about emotional, social, spiritual, philosophical, or physical life in the world. The apathetic may lack a sense of purpose, worth, or meaning in their life. If you don't have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have a clue what your worth is. And go to the Sermon on the Mount and see when Jesus talked about he feeds the birds of the earth. He says, are you not worth more than them? Apathy is about you don't care about how another person feels. Sympathy is you care about somebody else's trouble. Empathy is you feel and share somebody else's trouble or pain. You know, in, in Spanish, it, when you're some, you don't say, I'm sorry, you say, lo siento, which means I feel it. We need to feel each other's pain. We need to have empathy for one another. And doing that, we need to speak out and speak God's word into people's lives because the word of God is healing to the whole body. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for the time that we have. And Lord, it's so short, I just pray that you would quicken all of this to us. Lord, that this would not be the study, but this would encourage people to get into your word and study for themselves and see what you have to say to them. Because Lord, it's one thing to hear what somebody has said, what you've said to somebody else, but it's another thing when you speak directly to somebody. Because your words are life. Your words are God-breathed. They breathe life into us. So we'll pick this up again next week. Same time, same station, as they say. And until then, speak the truth in love. Tell somebody about the love of Jesus Christ. Tell somebody about the love of God and the Father that caused him to give Jesus Christ to die in their place. Amen and goodbye. Till next time. Bye, Jesus. Bye.